I thought that I will be offered water, which is natural. Uh, uh, no, not only just natural, <laughs> but I thought that I will have some nutritional water, because water now has it has become actually uh, it has already well established. So water is no longer a uh, new thing now. The next new thing which will come actually will be uh, nutritional water. Already it is there in the market, and uh, more so will come at, and maybe I think the next couple of years water will get replaced actually with the nutritional water that is a trend. All right, I come from an institute called Institute of, institute of Chemical Technology, and the nutraceutical, of course, uh, is a field which is fast catching it up, or rather, it has already been well established now. Anything which cannot be put into the pharmacy or into the medicine can be put into the nutraceuticals very conveniently. Am I right? Or rather, I'll put it the other way actually, whether the, the nutraceutical has grown up at the cost of the Ayurveda. Is it true? Is it true the nutraceutical, at least in our, in our country, it has developed at the cost of the Ayurveda? Because Ayurveda remained very closed. They did not allow to develop further. They did not accept the new thing in that. And with the result, people wanted to make use of the new things which were useful. And with the result, the new thing has come, FSSAI, correct? That is actually the, you know, the Food Safety Standards Authority of India. And they have come out actually and they opened up. Today, anything which cannot be put under the Ayurveda, you can conveniently put in Fasai. And you can easily get license and start the business. In a way, it is good that at least today we have outlet actually. I mean, uh, I mean I'll put it actually the government controlled outlet by which all this, all this uh, raw herbs or the nutraceutical items can be put into the market. And accordingly, a uh, number of companies have come forward. And today, I think that is the field which is doing with a the hectic activity there, be it uh, confectionery, be it water, or the juices, a lot of things have cropped in the, in the recent past. And trend is more towards preventive than curative. That is what the nutraceutical is all about. Okay. Earlier, we used to go to the doctors. In fact, I remember in my generation, uh, whenever we used to fall sick, three days at home, try. Nothing works. Then reluctantly, four days, we used to go to the physician. Okay, today, I don't think it is. The fast, no, the moment people turn 45, you, people start taking the measures. Whenever I go to the hotel and ask for the cup of tea, the next question, immediate question, which is asked for me is that, sir, with sugar or without sugar? And I get irritated. I still can have a sugar without any problem. But then that is the trend. Okay, and with the result, now today it has become more preventive than the curative. And uh, well, another important aspect which has led to this actually is this. Am I right? This is now, uh, no, the pocket is good. And with the result today we have become fancy. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, all right. I think it, we have become fancy today. And uh, most of the current health problems are not uh, disease, but those are disorders, lifestyle disorders. I remember we used to walk and go to the school. Today, I see actually in front of any school, the road remains jam. The children don't even walk for 100, 100 feet. They have, no, the parent drop them at the gate. From the gate, they get inside, they come out, get into the car. Okay, in the races, they go to the, you know, I mean, right in front, there will be a hotel, they will have a nice pav bhaji. And after three, four years, you'll find them, they become obese. Okay, obesity is fast catching up, which was not the problem. Malnourished country, we had actually, you know, till I remember, till 1960s, 70s, we had, we were not self-sufficient in the food. That time, obesity wasn't even, you know, uh, thought of it, or it was not heard the word. But today, it has become actually an important, I mean, uh, Pombi, you see actually a lot of people, I mean, even the media covers actually the anti-obesity treatment and all that which has come. So this is the status which is growing on currently. Let's get into the nutraceutical now. Can I have first slide, please? Slide, please. All right, nutraceuticals, hybrid of nutrition, the pharmaceuticals. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is a hybrid, more than food, but less than pharmaceutical. As I told you in the beginning, something which you cannot put it actually in the pharmaceutical, it can be conveniently put into the nutraceuticals and something you can make out from that because everything has some of the other aspects, some of the other activity associated with that. So it is convenient to put it into the nutraceuticals. Tomato we were eating for a long time without any problem, even when the nutraceutical was not born. Okay, but then today, 
Lycopene is in nutraceutical. Look at what has happened. Lycopene is in a nutraceutical now today. Next slide, please. All right. When we talk about the nutraceuticals, which are the sector now currently has been targeted? Probiotic, I mean, I mean, curd is something which was the inter, you know, integral part of our food. So I don't think, you know, I mean, probiotic was new, new to us. Well, when the antibiotics started, actually, then people have soon realized, actually, the antibiotics cannot distinguish between the good flora and the bad flora. And then the probiotics have started. But probiotics was an integral part of our food, so I don't think it is anything new. Well, we have put some more bacterial strain in that and you know, include the thing. But yes, probiotic is something which is now extensively popular. Proteins. Earlier, only soya protein was something which was heard about it. Okay, Today, of course, we have a lot of proteins from the pulses. We have a, a piece some that is actually, uh, you know, uh, peanut. Sorry, uh, I'm not peanut, I'm sorry, pea. Pea protein has become very popular now. Okay, whey protein, of course, was protein, you know, very popular with the uh, with athlete and with the bodybuilders, but now even the other pea, other proteins have become now slowly gaining a lot of importance. Amino acids, some of the amino acids are already been put, actually, they normally we pursue them as a precursor for formation of some important, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, a peptide, and then, of course, lead to the muscle formation. Phytochemicals and the plant extract, I'll be talking it, about it for a long, a long time actually, because that is my field which I am catering for a long time. Uh, fibers, is a goal we have taught to the undergraduate. It's a goal today we are having something else like you know, fructo oligosaccharide, or I have put the inulin. This is inulin, which is, I think, uh, if you are from the South India or the Karnataka, I think it's a part of the coffee. Chicory is very much actually a part of the coffee there. And chicory is rich in inulin, okay? Uh, vitamins, uh, I think I have put A2 ghee here. A2 ghee contains provitamin. It, it is rich in the beta carotene. Okay, we have a boss taurus and the boss indicus. Gir guy is boss indicus. Okay, and boss taurus is some jersey guy which has come actually from the UK. And uh, in general, cow ghee is rich in the beta carotene. Now we are undertaking one experiment, actually what we are doing it in Wapi, we are doing one project which is going on. We are feeding the cow, mainly the gear guy, and we are feeding with the additional amount of a beta carotene. And we are seeing the increase in the beta carotene content in the ghee, milk and accordingly into the ghee. So we are trying to give ghee which is fortified with the pro-vitamin A. And we are trying for the other constituent as well, other vitamin as well something which can be addressed through the milk. So it is not directly, but it is via animal, it has been directed. Pre Prebiotic, fructo oligosaccharide, inulin, those are the constituents. Carotenoid, as I told you, beta carotene is the one. Lutein is another one which has become popular. Lycopene, omega-3 fatty acid, for a long time we have fish oil. And we have a sector in the society which is vegetarian. So there was a problem how to, how to know, I mean, manage this particular requirement actually from the vegetarian source. And currently now we have a algal oil, algal oil coming actually from the algae, cyanobacteria, and that is rich in the EPA, that is eicosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid. Now the algal oil currently, which is available in the market, that contains almost 35% of EPA. Next important thing actually, which is from the vegetarian, vegetarian source, is linseed oil. However, linseed oil has some problem actually, and plus it is, you know, it is used elsewhere more economically, so with the result actually, <laughs> I'm sorry, linseed oil is something which is not very popular, but now for the vegetarian source, algal oil has become very popular now. Though right now, at this moment, it is pretty expensive, but I'm sure you now more people get into the cultivation of this algae, I think the price will get uh, you know, standardized. Omega-3, that is about, the, then, then of course about the minerals. Minerals are another thing, calcium is something, mixture of calcium, magnesium, zinc, those are very popular. And this has been regularly been given actually to the children, those who are in the growing age. And at the same time, now it has been also been targeted for the elderly people. Can I have the next slide, please? All right. Where this, in what form this uh, nutraceuticals are used? Now we have a food. I have put actually the chapati here. So this is cyanobacteria, which is a blue uh, cyanobacteria. And that is giving the blue color besides spirulina. So now this is a blue spirulina. Earlier, green spirulina became very popular. Now we have a blue spirulina which is coming into the market. And uh, this is what has been pancake and all that has been already been incorporated into it. Okay, so that is about the food. Then we have a beverages. Beverages is one sector which finds it you no know, easy application because nobody resists something to be drink. 
Okay, so a lot of nutraceuticals today are people are trying to offer it through beverages. Personal care product, well, collagen and all that do their personal care product. Animal nutrition is also now, nutraceutical is also catching it up with animal nutrition, especially with the pet. Dietary supplement or something, which is the another sector. So these are the various forms in which nutraceuticals or the functional foods have been offered. Next slide, please. All right, which are the sector which have been catered by the nutraceutical currently, the market trend, what has been? So by health benefit, if you look at by the health benefit, cognitive health, this is what most of the mothers are worried about, about their children. They want their children to be, <laughs> they want their children to be like a Vishnathan. Okay, Vishnathan Anand, everybody wants, I don't know and how many of you know, but then Vishnathan Anand was associated with uh, promotion of one product which was marketed by the CDRI, Memory Plus, that was a product. And they marketed through Vishwanathan Anand because Vishwanathan Anand is associated with the chess. All right, so cognitive health, that is one product actually, and a lot of uh, herbals have already been uh, incorporated, like Shankar Pushpi, something which is quite well established now. And there are a lot of products of the Shankar Pushpi which are in the market actually, which are targeted for the children, especially the 10th standard. Gut health, <laughs> gut health. Another sector which people are targeting is the gut health, and I am sure all of you must have seen the ad of uh, Anil Kapoor. I, th I think I need not go further into that. All right. Uh, heart health, another problem which is catching it up actually to the youngsters. Other day, I think uh, Satish Kaushik, okay, he had a, a massive heart attack and died immediately. So heart health is something which people are not targeting, and there are quite a few herbs actually which have been and we have Indian drugs, a lot of Indian medicinal plants, which are there actually, which have been used, uh, which have been used as a uh, nutraceutical product. Remember. Then bone health, another sector actually, which is more related to the women. Bone health is a problem, which is associated with the women and uh, sewer isoflavone. Uh, undergraduate diagene and the genistein. These are the two isoflavones which have become which have become very very popular. Besides uh, isoflavone, any other phytoestrogen? Phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogen is a topic actually which has been covered extensively, and it comprises of uh, besides soy isoflavone, it also comprises of lignan, and the major lignan which has been used actually for uh, for uh, estrogenic activity is SDG, seco isoaldehyde diglucoside. Okay, so that is actually, excuse me, <coughs> can I water? Thank you. All right, so that was about the bone, uh, phytoestrogen, and currently the soya is extensively used about uh, diazine and the genistein, these are the two isoflavones which are present in the soya, and that has been targeted actually as the estrogenic. They are the biggest advantage that uh, they are estrogenic, but they are not, they are free from rather side effect of the steroids. They are not steroid. They are having only the steroidal effect. Though their activity is much more less as compared to the estronum, estradiol or the other steroids, but they don't have any side effect as that of steroids. And with the result, actually, phytoestrogen is something which is fast catching it up. In, in the Europe, they have even the health bar in the form of a chocolate. Then we have a immunity is a sector which has, I think, the COVID we have seen. Uh, Tinospora. Tinospora became very, very popular. I have my own question mark with the reward it does. But yes, Tinospora cordifolia became very popular during that period, actually, COVID period. Those who have taken, I did not take any Tinospora. I'm here today. But yes, uh, Tinospora has been extensively used during that period, and Ashwagandha, these are the two plant material which were extensively used. Uh, likewise, in Western world, we have a ginseng, which is also used actually for the immunity boosters. Weight management, right, I, I began with that actually, the weight management is a major problem today, lifestyle, lifestyle problem, and uh, uh, eatables have changed drastically. What we were traditionally eating it, today we have changed. We have moved actually from chapati and rice to burger and pizza. 
and to some extent that is taking a toll in this sector and the weight management is becoming a problem now today. And uh, once the, of course, lifestyle and plus the eatable, both this thing together, it has led actually to the problem of obesity, which wasn't a problem in India, but now it has become a problem. And then once we catch, catch with the obesity, then of course it leads to the other problem. Next slide, please. All right, so that was about the different uh, you know, nutraceutical product and the sectors which were having the nutraceutical product. Now I'll be switching it over to the something which has been obtained from the plant source. Nutraceutical ingredient, well, the term is new, otherwise we call it with the different terms like phytochemicals, phytoconstituents, and quite a few of them actually are having the overlapping activity. They can be a drug also, and they can be a nutraceutical product as well. Next slide, please. Well, these are some of the products of the Indian origin, which has become popular as a nutraceutical. They have not become a drug till today. They are still remaining as a nutraceutical product or as a functional food or a food supplement. Whether it is curcuminoid, we are the largest exporter of the curcuminoid in the world. Okay, I don't know how many of you know, we have a turmeric which is growing in Maharashtra, major cultivator, thereafter Tamil Nadu is another cultivator, and then the new turmeric which has cropped in the market called the Lakadong turmeric. Okay, and that contains a very high percentage of curcuminoid to the extent of 10%. However, that is not suitable for the extraction purpose. Sometimes the psyche is very important. Though it contains 10%, but still it is not been used actually, and nobody is you know, ready to use that actually for the extraction purpose. Though only 95% extract is the one which is useful as a nutraceutical product, and you can get it actually, the extraction cost will be much more less for the lacquer turmeric because it contains 10% curcuminoid as against Sangli turmeric, which contains 6%, 5 to 6%. But then the problem associated with the lacquer turmeric is that the color is not smart. Major problem. Okay? So besides our health, we are also very cautious about the color of it, we need to have a smart, okay? So like around turmeric has not catch up so far actually for the extraction purpose. Elagic acid, another uh, plant material which has become popular from the Indian source. Pomegranate is the something uh, which has been used, pomegranate green rather, or the, or the skin of the pomegranate fruit has been used as a elagic tannin. It is the elagic tannin which it contains, and that is the one which has been targeted for nutraceutical, especially for the heart purpose. In fact, there's a, uh, there's the NRI actually who has a plant in a uh, Gujarat, and they are getting the pomegranate from Nashik, and they are using the skin of it and throwing the juice part of it. Okay, and uh, they have a brand called Pomela. Pomela is after the pomegranate, and it is the uh, elagic acid or the elagic tannin. Those are the ones which have been targeted actually as a for the heart ailment. Forscolin, another Indian plant, Coleus forscoli, a Libeti family of the Limeci family, and uh, it contains diterpene alkaloid, diterpene, and uh, this particular compound is, is actually promoting the lean body mass, and that is how it has been you know, related to the obesity. Piperin from the black paper, there's a product in Ayurveda called Trika2. Trika2 is a product in the Ayurveda which comprises of the black paper, long paper, and ginger, out of which two paper, they are the major constituent of the two paper is the piperin. And if you look at uh, Ayurvedic product, you'll find most of the Ayurvedic product as a default ingredient is either a black paper or the long paper. And today it has come to the light that the piperin, which is present in that, it helps in improving the bioavailability of the otherwise poorly bioavailable drug. Okay, so the purpose of the piperin is not very nutraceutical, but it helps or it aids in absorption of the other constituents which are given along with it. Lycopene from tomato, uh, this is hydroxycitric acid. Those who are from the coconut, probably they will be knowing it actually. Hydroxycitric acid, uh, it's a Radambe and Dhirambe. Garcinia indica and the Garcinia Cambogia. Garcinia indica is, I think, uh, cocum. And uh, Radambe and Dhirambe is the Garcinia Cambogia. And that contains hydroxycitric acid. And hydroxycitric acid also has the similar activity as that of phosphorylene that it metabolizes the lipid or the fat. And it also helps in obesity. Next slide, please. All right. I'll now slowly get into the plant derived nutraceutical ingredient, enrichment, extraction, and the isolation. Now, many plant constituents or the enriched extracts are used in the nutraceutical. I'll just take you through some of the plant actually, which we have started with it, and we have come out actually with isolated phytochemicals from that, which are used either in the nutraceutical or sometime in other industry besides uh, health industry. Next slide, please. All right, I'll start with the forscolin study, forscolin. Coleus forscoli. 
This is the product which was extensively worked at one time by the Hex company. And uh, they isolated a constituent called forcecoline from that. In fact, they worked on the 1,500 plant, out of which some three or four plants showed some promising action, out of which that three to four plant, one, four, one plant was forcecoline. I mean, coleus forcecoline, the constituent was forcecoline from that. And initially, the entire work on the forcecoline was targeted actually towards the heart. And ultimately, they found actually it was having the good effect on the heart, but at the concentration at which it was to be used, it was having the side effect. So they have to dump that molecule. So they dumped that molecule. Later on, the SAMI took up, look at this, they, SAMI took this molecule up. They re-looked at the molecule. And since this particular molecule was found to be having the one particular mechanism that it is, it was acting on the adenylate cyclase enzyme, which in turn improves the CMP level in the body. And it was found actually that the CMP level in the body gets reduced when you become obese. And that is how it has been targeted as an anti-obesity drug. Okay, and the forcecoline, it has become actually a standard drug, actually standard constituent of nutraceutical product when it comes to the anti-obesity or the or you know, getting getting over the obesity product, obesity problem. All right, so this is about the constituent that is forcecoline. These are the roots which are cultivated both in Karnataka and Maharashtra. And this is the plant, labiate, typical labiate plant or the lamiaceae plant actually, and the root of which I think uh, this month. This my April and May, even in Parla, I have seen this uh, root of the particular plant has been sold and it's been pickled by the Gujarati community. That much I can tell you. Okay? So the roots are pickled. Next slide, please. All right. So this is what the extraction isolation we, we uh, worked on uh, about the extraction isolation. Now, phosphorine has one important property of the phosphorine that it is soluble in methanol, it is soluble in the chloroform, but it is not soluble in the petroleum ether. And uh, because of its a solubility problem, to some extent, though it is having other activity also, but it is finding it difficult to use it because of the solubility problem. For example, now it is found to be having important action against glaucoma. But since the solubility is a problem, uh, it is not becoming actually a drug, though people are trying it a lot actually to make it actually a water soluble. But then the problem associated with it goes the diterpene, which is not soluble in water. All right. Extraction, well, it contains, the root contains about 0.8 to 1% force coloring in that. And uh, extraction technology has improved a lot over a period of time. Today, we have a supercritical extraction, which is, uh, I mean, when we talk about the extraction technology, supercritical is considered to be the latest one. But supercritical, none of the uh, extraction process is, uh, I'll put it actually the full proof. Every process of the extraction has its own merit and limitation. So likewise, in this particular case, we used actually two extraction processes. One was supercritical because if you look at the root, root contains two set of constituents. One is, of course, diterpene, forcecoline, and the other one is the monoterpenoid and the cisquiterpenoid, which is in the form of the volatile oil. And whenever we used to extract actually with a solvent, like ethanol or any other solvent, always monoterpene and the cisquiterpenoid will also come along with that. So that was a major problem. So ultimately, we resorted to the supercritical fluid extraction. And uh, I don't know how many of you know supercritical fluid extraction, but supercritical fluid extraction using carbon dioxide is well suited only for lipophilic constituent. Lipophilic constituent. Whereas if you look at this compound, it is having a hydroxy group, so it is slightly a polar compound. So in that case, but monoterpene and the sesquiterpenoid, they were non-polar. So we initially subjected actually for the low pressure, low bar pressure, that is 100 bar pressure, and at 40 degree temperature, that removed most of the monoterpenoid and the sesquiterpenoid. Later on, actually, the pressure was increased to 350 bar pressure, and uh, internal was added to the extent of one mole. That means alcohol was added along with the carbon dioxide. Then it has favored the extraction of the force coaling. But in spite of that also, we ultimately got the crude extract, which was containing high percentage of the force coaling. But yes, the major problem which was solved was it was not having the monoterpenoid and the sesquiterpenoid. And then it became very easy to separate phosphorine from that by the solvent fractionation. So we used to dissolve into the chloroform and then precipitate it by adding a petroleum methyl in that. Next slide, please. Well, this is about the effect of the phosphorine. It acts on the adenylate cyclase enzyme, which in turn has many uh, applications. Next slide, please. Another case study, mangiferin. Mangiferin has become now actually a nutraceutical product, it's a xanthone derivative. Mangiferin is a xanthone, 
which is present in uh, Mangifera indica, and which is present more in the bark part of it, less in the leaf part of it. Okay, fruit by and large does not contain much of the appreciable quantity, but then bark contains very high concentration to the extent of around three to six percent, and that too only the internal bark contents, not the not the external bark contents. Okay. This is anthon derivative, phenol phenolic compound, and phenolic compounds are normally associated with antioxidant action. Today, mangiferin is used as a powerful antioxidant in nutraceutical. Next slide, please. Well, this is the bark part of it. This is the, this is the mangiferin, and it was extracted because xanthone derivatives or the xanthone glycosides are not soluble in water, or they are very poor soluble in the water. So it was extracted with the ethanol. That one, the extract was concentrated, and thereafter it was into the water to precipitate the mangiferin. And after the mangiferin was, of course, was uh, refined actually with the help of alcohol and other solvent like petroleum ether. Next slide, please. This is just the confirmation of whatever we have extracted and the isolated, whether it's mangiferin or not. So these are all the confirmation spectral studies pertaining to that, which establishes that, yes, whatever we extracted, that was the mangiferin. Next. Confirmation of that, next. Another important, elagic acid, right in the beginning I said actually that the pomegranate was used for obtaining the elagic acid. We started with another plant material called Chiblic myrobalan, which belonged to the Combitacy family. And this is widely uh, growing in Maharashtra, especially in the region of Junnar and the Pune region. Extensively it is growing, in fact most of the tribal people, they have in their backyard the tree of Ermiana chibula. And we made use of this fruit, which contains almost more than 15% tannin in that. The dried fruit contains more than 15% tannin, and the tannins are both gallic tannin and elagic tannin. Elagic acid, as such, is not present in a fruit. It is not present in a fruit, but it is present in the form of elagic tannins. And which on hydrolysis gives elagic acid? Elagic acid today is another antioxidant which has been used in nutraceutical field. And you get two products from that. One is, of course, elagic acid. When you hydrolyze tannin, so the so extraction is very simple here in this case. Tannins are highly soluble in water. So the extraction has to be carried out in the water. The reason, not in a solvent or not even a boiling water. It has to be carried out in the cold water. The reason, because the myrobalan fruit contains starch. And if you use hot water, starch will get gelatinized and the filtration would be a major problem associated with that. There are, there, that is the reason that you should not be using any hot water, but use cold water. And since tannins are highly soluble in the water, it doesn't pose any problem. Once it has been uh, extract of the tannin has been obtained in the water, then of course that tannin need to be hydrolyzed with the help of the acid, mineral acid. On hydrolysis, you get elagic acid as well as gallic acid. And both of them bind their application in the commerce. Elagic acid, of course, goes as a nutraceutical, whereas gallic acid goes actually in the food industry as antioxidant to be used into a further derivative like propyl gallate, ethyl gallate, those are the, or the octyl gallate, those are the gallates which have been prepared. And those who are from the pharmacy, they should also be knowing one uh, API called trimethoprim. Trimethoprim, you need gallic acid for the synthesis of the trimethoprim. Okay, so that is the application of a gallic acid, which has been obtained from chebulic myrobalan. Next slide, please. Another plant material, which we started with a different uh, aim altogether. It was uh, egdasterone or the egdasteroids. These are the steroids, very unusual steroids. Uh, if you look at these steroids, they're having a lot of hydroxy group and they're more polar compound rather than non-polar compound. Okay, and egdasis is a phenomena of shedding the skin shedding the skin. This is a phenomena which is, in fact, we started this project actually for the sericulture, because in sericulture, uh, silkworm needs egdasone actually from passing to the instar. It, it has to pass to the five instars, okay? When the larva has to grow, there are five instars, and each instar normally lasts for three to five days. And during this period, from going to the first instar to the second instar, it has to shed the skin, then only it can grow in the size. If it doesn't shade the skin, it cannot go in the size, and with the result, it will not develop further. So this shedding of the skin is being controlled by the hormone called egdasone. So we started with this work, and after fifth instar, when the larva fully grows, then it starts spinning the cocoon around it. That is what the application of egdasone. But today, egdasone is for new application, the nutraceutical, and today, egdasone is used more as a muscle building and the body building. Okay, so the egdasteroids are obtained. In fact, it is uh, 
cider cordy folia that is the plant which contains sigdaisone but we started with the altogether new plant called ipomia hedyracea next slide please ipomia hedyracea so these are the seeds of the ipomia which contains uh, besides of course it contains uh, resin also but then it contains high concentration of the dextroids we had one difficulty during the process of the extraction that since it was from the seed we had a uh, interference of the lipid from the seed and company wanted 15% ecdasone in their final extract which can be used actually for the subsequent application and we had a difficult time to get the 15% ecdasone the reason was the oil part of it but then we we employed actually a very simple technique of refrigeration wherein the lipid got congealed and with this we were able to get more than 15% ecdasone in the form of the extract and the, today ecdasone is being used actually as a body building nutraceutical next slide please and the plant material khelin khela is of course not is the indian plant material it is actually of the egyptian origin and this plant contains a khelin which is actually furanochromon this is a furanochromon which is once again extensively used actually for the nutraceutical in that region of course khela is very not very popular here but it is used in the in the africa so it has like, some application like in the colic kidney stone so those it is in use next slide please and kelin is present in a khela that is a fruit of amivis naga okay so this is the extraction process what we started with it it was extracted i'm sorry this is mistake here. actually it is not the bark it is the fruit part of it so the fruit started with the methanol uh, sorry ethanol and then after it was concentrated then what was the extract we got it was actually treated with the petroleum mixture a number of times to deal with the lipid fraction and there after to separate the furanochrom kelin is a furanochromone next slide please all right this was the confirmation of kelin next well we uh, we developed the method actually for isolation of the kelin and with the result we keep captured this you know this method and it was duly put in as a reference into the wikipedia next folic acid is been obtained from a two plant either it is obtained from the tulsi that is osimum sanctum or it is obtained from the rosemary they are the two plant which have been used actually for obtaining ursolic acid ursolic acid is a pentacyclic triterpenoid this is a pentacyclic triterpenoid and ursolic acid besides being used in the cosmetic it is also used for the internal um, application of the internal use and uh, ursolic acid as i told you it is for, it is present in the tulsi as well as in the rosemary and both of them are taken internally however we found out the different source of called the nerium oleander though this particular plant is considered to be a toxic but once you separate the ursolic acid i mean from the toxic constituent toxic constituent is the oleandrin oleander is a toxic constituent and that constituent present more in the root part of it rather than the leaf part of it whereas we use the leaf part of it which contains almost more than 4% ursolic acid in a leaf so that was very attractive source actually rather than tulsi or for that matter rosemary which contains very less percentage of the ursolic acid unfortunately in market tulsi extract now is been sold in terms of the ursolic acid content in that and some people have approached to me that they wanted to supplement or spike the tulsi extract with the ursolic acid from the other source so it has gone to that level all right coming back to the ursolic acid the ursolic acid is a pentacyclic triterpenoid of the ursin type of the beta uh, alpha myrin type and it is found to be present in the leaf part of it to the extent of 4% and if you look at the ursolic acid it has the carboxylic acid group we made use of this particular functional group for this isolation of it extraction of course it was done with the common solvent but isolation we made use of the carboxylic acid group by reacting with alkali and then separating from the other debris and then of course regaining the ursolic acid by adding the equivalent amount of the acid to that next slide please this was the case scheme which was followed the leaves were taken they were dried actually extracted with the solvent and since ursolic acid is not soluble into the water after you concentrate the solvent put it into the water to to precipitate that ursolic acid and along with the other constituent which are present in that and later on dissolve into the 2% uh, sodium hydroxide in ethanol very naturally the ursolic acid forms salt with that it remains into the organic layer and remaining other impurities which are more lipophilic like steroids and all that that remain insoluble into that separate that from that and then regain the ursolic acid by adding equivalent amount of the acid in that so that is how the ursolic acid was separated to the course ursolic acid capsules are already in the market so ursolic acid is another candidate which has been used in the nutraceutical next slide please 
This is just the confirmation of that. Next. All right. Now, this is actually one a patent which we filed about the extraction technique. In fact, one nutraceutical product was there, and we had a composition of the herbs. Some of the constituents were hydrophilic and some were lipophilic. So, and we filed a patent. So the query came actually how particular one particular solvent will be used for why not other solvent? Because we used, actually, we stated that yes, we are going to use water, ethanol, and the mixture of the combination of the water and the ethanol. And ultimately, we have to prove that yes, water and the alcohol mixture is the one which has been suitable for extracting all the constituents which are present in all the herbs which are incorporated into the formulation. Because it was a one extract, um, one extract which was scattered out by mixing all the herbs together. Normally, it's a practice in the industry that you either extract the individual drug or combine all the drug and then you extract it. Normally, people prefer to combine all the drug because it saves operation and we also did the same thing. However, we have to justify that why we use this particular combination. And in that case, we proved this combination by the simple TLC method. So you can see here the first track is standard amygdalin. We have the three different constituents. This is amygdalin, this is hydroxy safflower yellow, and this is beta acerone. So they are the three constituents. This is coming actually from the semen persica. This is, of course, uh, safflower. And this is coming actually from uh, calamus. So they are the three drugs which were there in the, plant, in the formulation. So when we did the amygdalin part of it, the first track is uh, what the first track actually is extract in the ethanol. Second is the mixture of the ethanol in the water, and the third is the water extract. So if you see the amygdalin, amygdalin is found to be present in all, though in water it is less, in mixture of the water and the alcohol it is more. In case of the safflower yellow, alcohol do not show the presence of safflower yellow because it is not soluble in alcohol whereas it is, it is showing the presence in the water come alcohol mixture and water as well. Whereas the third beta acerone, which is more lipophilic, in water it is not been found to be present, but in water and alcohol, yes, in alcohol, yes. But when the three are mixed together, so definitely, now the choice here is actually, you can see in the central tag amongst the three extracts, always show the presence of both the constituents. So mixture of combination of the water and the alcohol is useful to extract all the constituents which are present in the three different herbs. Next slide, please. Well, these are some of the phytoconstituents. I have a long list of the phytochemicals which we have been able to isolate in our laboratory. And uh, we have so far around 60 plus phytochemicals which have been available from our laboratory. And quite a few of them, we have been able to take it up actually to the industrial level as well. Next slide, please. I'll just give you this four plant material which we have been able to take up to the industrial scale. First was aloe barbarensis. Now, aloe barbarensis contains constituent called barbaloin. Barbaloin is anthraquinone glycoside. And uh, it is used, barbaloin or other aloe as such is used actually as a purgative. Whereas what we have done actually, we have separated the aloe emodine part of it. Barbaloin is a glycoside. This is a which is glycoside. This is aloe emodine. Aloe emodine is a glycone of the barbaloin. And uh, we developed a process, industrial process actually, for the separation of aluimodine from the barbaloin without separating barbaloin from the crude extract. So it was an in situ generation of aluimodine and thereafter separation by the solvent. And today, aluimodine is an important intermediate for the synthetic, for the synthetic synthesis of uh, API called diacerin. Diacin is the only API which is currently used as an anti-athletic drug, and that is included in Indian pharmacopoeia. And there is no other source to obtain diacin but to resort to the extraction and isolation of the barbaloin, barbaloin to aloimodine, aloimodine to rind, and rind to diacetyl rind, that is called diacerin. And diacerin is an API today which is used, which is useful as an anti-athletic drug. So this is the one uh, technology. Another technology was of course, this is a this is a not Indian fruit. It is actually from the Africa, called Thumatococcus daniel, and this particular fruit is called Ketempe fruit locally in Africa, and uh, this fruit is having the sweetener which is called thumatin, and thumatin is two thousand times more sweeter than water. Sorry, more sweeter than sugar. Okay, two thousand times. Only problem with the, this sweetener is that this is a protein sweetener protein sweetener, so it is not suitable for hot beverages. It is only suitable for cold beverages and the ice cream. 
but not suitable for the hot beverages and with the result and at the same time it is more very expensive currently thumatin which is isolated from this is having the rate of around 3.5 lakh rupees per kg okay and uh, being a protein, we had a lot of problem actually for the extraction because you cannot use any solvent, you cannot use any heat treatment, you cannot use any chemical. It has to be extracted in water. It has to be then, since it was obtained from the fruit, we had a lot of, uh, I mean, impurities or rather the uh, a problem of the mucilage and other carbohydrate which was interfering in the extraction, the separation. But we used the chelating agent for this for the complex in the carbohydrate and then separating the. Uh, protein part of it from that and then of course uh, the compound the thumatin is around 21 kd that means it is having the molecular weight of 21,000 and with the result thereafter the final separation was by the membrane we use the 5 kd membrane so 5 kd membrane it has passed all the lower molecule and retained actually the larger molecule and that one we have to undertake the freeze drying and that is why the process is very expensive and with the result the price of the thumatin is also very expensive Another is terminal Chibula. We have been able to set up actually the industry for the extraction, the isolation of tannins and other products which includes elagic acid, gallic acid. These are the uh, products which have been obtained actually from the terminal Chibula and the plant has been set up in a junior and uh, by the tribal people. So this is the elagic acid which has been obtained and we are able to get around 3% elagic acid from dried Chibulic marijuana through, which, uh, besides seed. Another technology is the Coleus Force Coli, and uh, that is for the force pulling. Though market demands only 10 to 20 percent, but for the analytical work, what you need actually is 98 to 99 percent, and we have been able to reach about 98 percent of the force pulling by the extraction, the isolation method. Recently, we also during COVID, Godrej approached to us actually. Of course, nothing to do with the nutraceutical; it's more to do with the uh, life. I mean, uh, this is the product actually henna leaf. Hena is a big product actually for the Godrej because Godrej is having a hair dye as an important product, 5,000 crore sector. And they wanted actually that uh, Hena should be uh, improved, the content of the dye should be improved than the natural. Natural content is only 1.5%, that too in the form of the glycoside. So it is not immediately available for dyeing the hair. So they wanted to jack it up to around 20%. We took up this project actually, and today we have a technology by which we can convert henna leaf, natural henna leaf into a 20% low zone that is again a natural. And we, of course, we have been able to go right up to the 98%, but they wanted only 20%. So we have prepared 20% low zone content from the henna. And as I told you, it is not present in the free body. Low zone is an aftaquinone. Naphthaquinones are the one which are normally been found to be soluble in the alkali. We made use of the alkali, of course, mild alkali, and later on, of course, it was extracted in the solvent. And then, of course, it was subsequently treated with other constituent. I will not be able to reveal to you, but yes, those are the constituent. Eventually, we were able to get more than 20% loss in content for their hair dye. So this was about the uh, henna jacked up to jacked up the content of the loss to 20%. Next slide, please. Well, these are some of the uh, monographs. Uh, I mean, these are the monographs, quality standards of the Indian medicinal plants published by the ICMR. And we have been, as a center, ICT, we have been able to contribute around 60 monographs, uh, which have been duly covered in this monograph. Next slide, please. These are some of the nutraceutical products which we have been able to come out. You can go to the website called Erlang. And we have come out right now with the four products, Rekindle for men, Rekindle for women, and Replenish. These, are the two, these two are gummies, these two are chocolate. We are addressing the problem. Main, the one which has been meant for the main is for the energy. For the women, it's for the addressing the estrogenic problem. And replenish and the uh, replenish green and the replenish phyto is for the uh, something which you are not getting in your regular diet to compensate that. So these are the two gummies. Now we are coming out with one and one more nutraceutical product for the sleep, insomnia. That is, uh, I don't know how many of you know, the melatonin. Melatonin is the one actually which has been released when you fall asleep, okay? And we are coming out with a natural melatonin content, which is normally been found to be present in a plant called uh, walnut. Juglans nigra. Juglans nigra contains more of the melatonin in that as compared to the Juglans regia. Okay, so those are the nutraceutical products. Well, these are some of the cosmetic products, and of course, aloe best. 
and aloe vera, we have been able to set up under CSR for the PD light. And this particular uh, project actually is in Bhavnagar. Next slide, please. That's it about the nutraceutical, more and more drug, more and more plant materials will be in future will be covered as a nutraceutical rather than drug because nutraceutical finds is easier way and it is acceptability is much more easier as compared to the drug. And with the results in future, more Ayurvedic drug will be crossing it over as a nutraceutical rather than Ayurvedic drug. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please put hands together and give him a bigger round of applause for Professor K.S. Lada. Sir, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. I'd now like to request Dr. Rajendra Gurau, sir, principal of HV Desai College, to felicitate our speaker. Thank you so much for being with us, sir, here today. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Come on. If anybody has any question. <laughs> or if, if I Thank take so it that everything was understood well. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about extracting uh, from nerium oleander, nerium plant. Yeah. The leaves have a white latex. It's toxic, as you also mentioned. Oh, no, so leaf does not have the latex. In fact, uh, I think uh, there's some little confusion. Petiole does have. No. When you pluck it, petiole comes out with latex, white latex, sir. I doubt. Uh, I'm a botanist, okay. Okay, so I, I, have, I think I've seen it. Fine. It's little, it's less. Okay. It's not like so much like Thivesia yeah, yellow, Thivesia yellow yeah, but plus, it is there. Uh, yeah, okay. So my question to you is, sir, how do you take care of the safety of the isolated compound then? Okay. Uh, as long as you are taking the content to the 98th percent or the 99th percent, there's hardly a scope for anything else coming into that. So if you improve the purity part of it, your other constituents, which are even otherwise may be a problematic, they will not matter much actually because they are not present in your extract or in your isolated constituent. Uh, so safety doesn't have to be checked. That is I just what I want so. to know. I don't think so. Okay, thank yes. you. Sir. As long as the purity is very high, you don't have to. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it is in Ayurveda, it is the root which has been recommended and that is more toxic. That contains oleandrin, which leaf I don't know whether it contains to that extent, but then root contains high percentage of the oleandrin in that. And that too, it is toxic only at the certain high dose. Okay, because otherwise oleandrin itself at one time it was tried actually as a cardiotonic and the low, less concentration, it can be used as a cardiotonic because it is a C23 glycoside. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And I'd like to request Dr. Rajendra Gurav, sir, to kindly felicitate our speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a big round of applause for Professor K.S. Lada. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. Thank you, sir. And you're the sleepy product. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, gentle reminder for the I3 presentations. Please submit your presentations to the laptop station in front of the stage, requesting all the I3 okay. presentations that are finalized to kindly present your uh, yes, so PPTs you as soon as possible to the laptop you stations here. Yeah. All right. So Moving on to our next panel discussion. Are we ready? Yes. All right. Let me do a small energizer. All right. Everyone. I'm only using your hands because everyone is seated. All right. Get your hands up. Come on. Hands up. And 90, as always, 90. Please don't do this. That way I'll know you were sleeping. This is 180. All right. This is 90. All right. Okay. Let's do this. Come on. Three, two, one. Clap. Everyone is awake? Yeah? Super. Let's get started with our next panel discussion. All right. 
on that note ladies and gentlemen remember the nsic clap can we do one more time just so i know you remember the clap wait 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 i'll give you a count on 3 2 1 one more time everyone is just clapping what is the point of today's interaction then <laughs> all right but remember 1 1 2 3 4 1 1 2 3 4 all right up next everyone is trying also love the josh how's the josh by the way 3 2 1 how's the josh hi sir how's the josh hi sir how's the josh hi sir hi very nice okay now ladies and gentlemen the final panel discussion for this incredible evening that is on the current scenario of natural ingredients in pharma ladies and gentlemen are we ready in 3 2 1 make some noise <laughs> lovely whoever is who so many owls in the audience woo all right next up please put your hands together and make some noise for the first panelist in this incredible panel discussion mr ajit patel director of alpha chemical pet limited yes a bigger bigger round of applause come on mr ajit patel moved to mumbai for education and work for rashtriya chemical fertilizers limited and shell oil in saudi arabia he returned to india and worked for bombay dyeing before establishing alpha chemicals in 1997 Alpha Chemicals started with a small facility and received orders on a contract basis. Within a few years, the company acquired major clients and grew its operations. Mr. Portal's wife joined the company and took over the accounting department. Mr. Portal has been with Alpha Chemicals for over 25 years, ladies and gentlemen, and has a facility that meets international standards. His children have been formally inducted into the company and are being trained to lead the organization in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible Mr. Rajat Patel, a big round of applause for him. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Next up, we have Dr. Sunita Shailajan, a big, big round of applause for ma'am. Come on, make some noise. She was a former head deputy for botany in Ramnarayan R U I A College. Come on, big, big round of applause. Let's keep the applause going. Thank you so much. She has completed 14 government funded research projects and currently has one project in progress as a principal investigator. She has two patents generated from the DST project. She has guided 15 PhD students in botany, biotechnology, bioanalytical sciences and applied biology who are now well placed in industries. Member of the HPTLC association in Switzerland and steering committee DBT for screening projects under Star College scheme published published 117 research paper that is 117 research papers in high repute international and national journals attended 70 conferences as an invited speaker and won a gold medal for research work in bangkok and she's also for various international research journals and appointed as a member of the core committee of experts for lesson plan on climate change a global project Yes and finally she coordinated national hands on training workshop on innovative experiments in biological sciences for college teachers and co-authored a book on manuals of life manuals in life sciences published by the government of india under dsc star college scheme ladies and gentlemen the incredible dr sunita shailajan thank you so much for being with us ma'am and finally we have dr sasi kumar menon give us a big round of applause come on he is the director of institute of advanced research in interdisciplinary services that is the tdm lab as a recognized research guide at the university of mumbai they they supervised 23 phd and 22 msc students that's incredible 23 phd ladies and gentlemen his research interests include drug toxicology herbal drugs drug action reproductive physiology male contraceptives ecology and biodiversity conservation as a principal investigator slash study director he's been involved in over 350 350 drug trials in humans over 60 trials on cosmeceuticals and nutraceuticals in humans and over 150 drug toxicological studies in animals they've also served as a co investigator of projects funded by dbt dst and ayush ministry of health government of india with over 100 research publications in national and international journals and has an h index of 19 and 1330 that is 1330 citations ladies and gentlemen the incredible dr sashi kumar menon sir thank you so much for being with us here today and as always we have 
our incredible moderator, Mr. Rohit from Ora Nutricam. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big, big round of applause. And ladies and gentlemen, over to you, sir. Once again, a warm good afternoon to everybody. So the next topic for our panel discussion is current scenario of natural ingredients in pharma, a very difficult topic though, uh, but a very, very competent panel to handle this discussion. Before I start the discussion, Ladda sir, it was, it was really an honor to hear you. And I think many students were just, not only students, dignitaries were mesmerized to have you here. I mean, it was it was an honor. Thank you so much for coming. So let's start with uh, Dr. Sunita. Uh, Ma'am, we all were just listening to your accolades and achievements. I think it's an Thank honor you. to be here and having a panel discussion with you. So uh, what is the current scenario of natural ingredients in pharma? Are there any natural ingredients being used in pharma or what is what is happening around that? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm not used to sitting and talking much, so I just uh, uh, half standing kind of. Uh, since last two days in this conference, I think all of you know more than me about this question, what has been happening. And uh, uh, Dr. Lada just told us took us through the journey of so many phytochemicals. Uh, with my experience in pharma industry, they have been using a lot of natural ingredients. And as this title says, natural specialty ingredients. I just read it as natural hyphen specialty ingredients. It means natural from natural bioactives, specialty ingredients. I'm just giving my perception of the title as I took it at. Uh, so they have been using, I'll complete that sentence, they have been using natural ingredients, but not completely, I think. Uh, like we just saw some of the examples which Sir gave, Dr. Ladas gave, that there are so many phytochemicals present, but these phytochemicals, unless you uh, isolate them, characterize them, and then connect, relate them with a bioactive, uh, as a bioactive molecule or therapeutic activity, they are not really useful. You have to isolate these bioactives and then you have to show that they are active with some therapeutic activity. What I have been doing, we have been doing in the lab, in our lab is that instead of isolating it out, which is a daunting task we have seen, we take enriched extracts. So I feel that pharma industries should more encourage these enriched extracts, which would have the address of not just one bioactive, but it may have three, four, five bioactives. And we know that these bioactives, say for example, gallic acid, delagic acid, or solic acid, which are useful in female reproductive disorders also can be used. So in pharma industry, they have been used, in short to conclude it, they have been used, but not to the fullest potential of these uh, phytochemicals. Also, just one minute I'll take here, a uh, few seconds more I'll take here, is that there's a also related variability with all these phytochemicals. So I think it is not uh, so much in favor currently with pharma industries, unless they have the experts, uh, specialists there who know about the plants, who will give you the uh, proper plants and proper bioactives isolated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, moving on to Dr. Menon. Uh, what steps are being taken at the academic or industrial research or the government level to push the use of natural ingredients in pharma? Now, here there's a pertinent point that uh, Dr. Sunita mentioned that there are not maybe enough experts who understand those phyto extracts. So, is there is a is there a dearth uh, of cross-functional expertise uh, happening? Is there a dearth of that? Yeah, I would also start with Dr. Ladda's talk. You know, he mentioned a very interesting thing that how one company wanted him to add the phytochemical in the extract and show that it is more. Today, that's the unfortunate thing. You get aloe, 
aloe vera extract with so much percent aloe. We still don't know whether it is truly aloe vera extract because, uh, you know, uh, Sunita is there. She is much expert in botany. Most of these, uh, you know, phytochemicals that we talk about therapeutically active are secondary metabolites. And these plants produce this mainly when they are under stress. So if you grow aloe vera in a very nice, luxurious way, the allocin contain, allowin contain, everything goes down. So it's very important that how the farmer cultivates. So there are a lot of technology that has gone in today to, of course, see that this kind of things doesn't happen. Okay. What is another thing which is missing is uh, the government. I, you know, as uh, Dr. Ladda said, Ayush is doing quite a lot of uh, work to bring it up. I'll give you a simple analogy. When we take uh, paracetamol tablet, any brand, normally the dose is very clear. It is 500 milligrams of paracetamol. If you take uh, any of the Ayurvedic product, uh, he said Thrikatu, or uh, any other simple Vati, they'll tell you the ingredient, but we are not sure whether it is 10 milligram, 200 milligram, or 500 milligram. You know, this Ayush advisor who was there during this talk with our manufacturers, we had a nice uh, meeting. The manufacturers were crying. They're saying we are small scale industry, we are medium scale industry, we don't have HPLC, we don't have GC. But this advisor was very strong. He said, if you can't tell me that your tricker two is containing so much of pipe stop your production. I mean, today, even a small scale industry which is making a paracetamol has to show the purity and assay. Why should we take Ayurvedic product or so-called herbal product or so-called nutraceutical containing phytochemicals without proper label claim? So this is what government is trying to push. So all the things that he was talking about, the Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia has come. Uh, they are now revamping the Ayurvedic uh, formulary. There is going to be a directive on nutraceuticals. Uh, because we are now trying to recognize reverse pharmacology because there is so much of history of our traditional use of herbs. So can we, uh, like she just mentioned, use Enrich extract and do very simple trials and try to bring it in the market. Basically as a, uh, you know, adjuvant therapy to the normal modern therapy. So, but the manufacturers are the biggest hurdle. They just don't want to use technology which is mandatory in a modern medicine. I don't know why. Why shouldn't I know my Chavan Pras is having so much of, uh, uh, you know, vitamin C? I mean, there is a joke actually. There is so much of Chavan Pras produced in India that so much of Amla weather grown in India is not very clear. So how much, what is going into Chavan Pras, we don't know. Yeah, true. So... So uh, we, sir, had I would small, just... we had a small discussion on Chavan Prash yesterday. <laughs> so if you see the audience... We missed it, so maybe quickly you can just tell us. <laughs> so, uh, so in fact, my first job uh, with a very big corporate, not very professional to name it, um, and there was a project to see a particular brand had given their Chavan Prash for testing. And... The person who was testing it came up very surprisingly. A close friend we were standing close by came back saying that, Yaar, isme to chavan prash lagi nahi raha hai. Avla lagi nahi raha hai. We went to our boss, submitted it to him. He said, keep it here, I'll see. Next day he said, no need to discuss. So, we were very new and naive. So, we didn't know what to say. After a couple of days, he called us and said, Exactly the same words. Jitna aula India or Bangladesh mein banta hai, usse double to chon prash bikta hai. Maine ka sir, jata kya hai, wo to bata do, matlab at least baaki kuch nahi bataoge to. Kate hai, Loki jati hai, usme welcome to the corporate world and he just started working. So sir, so, you have given the answer that what is happening in pharma industries because we are academicians, <laughs> so maybe we... we uh, uh, just one more thing, since we are talking about it, like Dr. Lada spoke about coleus phoscolin, Initially, when the work was going on in Hext, my brother was involved, so I knew about it also. Uh, uh, sir, initially when coleus phoscolin, when they were trying to extract phoscolin from there, it used to come from Uttarakhand. Yeah. And I remember yeah. a botanist used to go specially to that place and collect it. Uh, because phoscolin content with whatever plants were available here was very less. So, sir, this is the variation. 
and because of this variation also there is a problem for uh, using herbals for in in pharma industries i think that's also i feel a very important point thank can, you can we have the mic with dr ladha please <laughs> yeah, i think we can call sir here only <laughs> <laughs> so there is there is something which i personally also want to know let's leave the panel discussion as yeah. for one minute there is always this fight jala marathi madhe dwandva mantat mana madhe ayurveda homeopathy or allopathy now all of it leads to ingredients finally because the perception that general public has whether technocrats or non technocrats is that medicine typical medicine is all about chemicals ayurveda is all about naturals and homeopathy god knows i don't know what is it about so what well if you look at the aim of all the system is to healthcare yeah. aim is same yeah there is no different true okay so i think we should complement each other whatever is good we we'll pick it up and take it further but sir the entire confusion uh, around this what I, i i completely understand what you're trying to say uh, but the entire confusion in the mind of any consumer is if i eat this chemical is it going to damage if i if i so so what is being portrayed is what is more natural what is more ayurvedic is good for health medicines are not good for health so this is not the forum where where we get into this discussion but to continue from what i asked to dr menon is this entire confusion because there is a dearth of cross functional resourcing or cross functional intelligence being put into this industry is there a dearth of it no i think uh, a proper education should be passed on to the masses most important okay and it is not see most of the ayurvedic drug has led to the api if you look at uh, rolfa serpentina resepin has come from that it has become a property of the now uh, allopathy so it is not that plan do not have and even today if you lo- if you ask me which is the best uh, hepatoprotective drug it is silamarin which is continue to be obtained from the plant only there is no other alternative to that so it is not that the plan do not have the capacity only thing that the way in which ayurveda was practiced today unfortunately due to the excessive commercialization they are unable to resort to those ancient processes and with the result i think today whatever the medicine which they are selling it it doesn't have that kind of efficacy so according to me i think the good amount of research should go into the ayurveda ki what was happening in the traditional processes and we should simulate that processes looking you know, taking into consideration the modern technology without compromising any good content from that and that is what currently according to me the most modern manufacturer they switched over to, to the modern methods without realizing within the whether the traditional knowledge which was there whether it is getting passed on with a modern technique that is a big lack on i feel i completely agree with sir absolutely sir that is what you just said crux of the things is that you take ahead these traditional formulations and use all modern techniques and prove and show to the world that this is this is how it works that's really the thing sir uh, mentioned about ma- uh, knowledge i mean the information to masses it's my personal experience which i would like to share with the audience we have published a paper on tenospora recently uh, it came during the covid times that people started using tenospora left right and center there were people growing tenospora in their kitchen window and everybody was taking <laughs> the stem leaf and everything and even ayush had put it on their website that tenospora can be had and this came through a doctor friend of mine she called me up said uh, dr men and i'm getting lo- lots of patient with liver cirrhosis and one common thing i found in many of them he said they were all using this kada of uh, tinospora so guduchi and then uh, everybody was using either the stem somebody was losing leaf and somebody was buying it from the market but all of them were having so they had a Uh, idea that probably there is some connection so we also did some study at uh, the extracts and so on what we found was very interesting that tenospora is known to be an immunomodulator i mean it's known for it all these patients also had some immune compromised autoimmune problems like osteoarthritis was there rheumatoid arthritis was there in many of them and when they took this in larger amount because it's in ayurveda it is to be given only under the monitoring of a vaidya 
you cannot just take it. it there is a dose properly mentioned for it and these people are taking excess of it and they all had aggravation of their internal autoimmune problems and that led to liver cirrhosis moment they stopped and they had to be given complete treatment we when we first initially published this paper there was lot of questions from ayush direct phone calls what is this hot are you writing this is anand i mean guruchi is so famous in ayurveda how can you say it is toxic but it has to be seen there is a sub population in human who can have such problem you cannot just generalize so traditional doesn't mean safe and i personally believe and even she will agree that in our experience i always say go for traditional medicine as an adjuvant don't go it for 100% cure if you have bp or if you have sugar your modern drugs will bring down in half an hour you will not have that kind of extract of plant which will act so fast that's but the side effects of this modern drug will not be there in your extract that is true but so adjuvant approach is would be much better so complement each other as sir said so i think yesterday we also discussed that google uncle and whatsapp university also need to be checked in this case uh, moving over to you mr patel uh, again the question is being repetitive but it is being now made industry specific uh, what is the current industry spend on r&d for use in pharma because you come from industry background you have a superb laboratory where you research a lot of products what is your take on that yeah in the morning session i think we repeated this question that it is about 7 to 15% of the global trend so that's also in yeah, pharma because yeah, we that yeah, time we were yeah, talking no, about in the, the entire industry so yeah it is in the general pharma but now you ask specially for the green yes so i don't think there is a separate everybody is segregating that that much i would spend on the green and that much on pharma like that it is business so in the business uh, there are strategies that those who wants to start to make the profit immediately on the immediate this thing they will go for the normal things thing and now the green and everything will be just like yesterday rajil said that it is uh, for after 5 years that is what you have to invest into it so for that those people who are their strategies is like that they will go for the green the income is more spent on the green so research so that will but the, i there is the i don't think uh, exact data or anything i don't have exact data about that okay but but investing in r and d as an industrialist uh, how feasible is it or what is the gestation period because here there are a lot of students who would be aspiring to become entrepreneurs so the only thing that is going to make them survive is their own research and development so what would be your uh, message i mean should it uh, be uh, an incremental innovation or a disruptive innovation that they should look at from the beginning how do you how do you look at it the first thing is that uh, it's a whatever we said that 7 to 15% of the revenue and whatever it talk that is for the established industry in what the revenue you are getting but we are now question is changed to the startups now when there is a startup and then when they go for the startup it is what they want to do so they want to do so that's why going for the startup they will research something and they want to do something like that so there is a no choice that further are in there but the startup has to start their thing first and do at their best whatever they want to do it and once the revenue starts generating then they go for another r and d and everything whatever the diversification or whatever it is thank you so much uh, madam both of you come from academic background so question is to both of you how do you see the role of startups in pushing you know uh, i would not call them natural but at least ethical ingredients or or honest ingredients because i am doing my management development program in in one of the most reputed iims in the country and uh, we had a case study recently and unanimously all all the top honkos there felt that you know uh, if there is one industry that needs to go ethical with ingredients or honest with ingredients is the pharma industry now one of the most human effect bearing industry and if it is being spoken if ethics come into question uh, how do you see the role of startups then 
not only in ingredients but in pushing ethics as well in the industry i think you can start uh i think that pushan is a chona you can give an example uh, uh also so i was listening to your question see uh and to sir also my question on behalf of students because we are uh, professors ourselves that can a researcher be a startup or entrepreneur it is to me yes sir to to yeah. you to sir or maybe others can also so, answer research he is doing the research because he likes that thing but when you want to do go to start up it if you like to start some business or anything then you can start it but only because you have researched something like that no what i mean to say a researcher means uh, doing research in some area where he is really interested he has come out with especially in pharmacy colleges they he has come out with some good results so can that be his career or her career later on yeah the career in that say you can say that uh, uh, research only research it doesn't mean the business uh, but and, you and you he can go to that business but for that uh, business is like this that you should be a master of uh, uh, jack of all and master of one at least none is not i'm saying okay so it should be like that yeah unfortunately research is considered as see sir the questions answers are coming research is considered as it's not something you are doing wholeheartedly you are not coming out with results exactly you are, uh, it, it's it cannot be something like you know which can give you returns but i think as so now i'll come to this question sir uh, what we have been the, actually talking about sir spoke about pushyanu ga chuna so what we can take up take as startups what they can do is take traditional formulations and work on it for its authenticity and they should work with complete honesty this is what i, I don't know how much it's going to work in business and in pharma industry which also includes herbal industry i think the need of the er is that we all should work with honesty and i'll give you one example for that is like in herbal industry in biodiversity india is one of the the best but unfortunately the products which go out of this country or which are being used by us also are not of really good quality there is lack of quality control assessment etc so if that work is done with honesty there will be demand of it and there will be startups like once again so i'll go to the example of pushyanu ga chuna which is being used for uh, various female reproductive disorders so our, my students worked phd two of them got their phd on this this work when we collected pushyanu ga chuna from about six uh, manufacturers pushyanu ga chuna is one formulation which is being made by every big ayurvedic or herbal company so when we check the quality of it sir we saw so many variations in it and then we also did the efficacy on rat model and we really found that finally out of six only two were worth taking ahead now that i can say because we had made one reference formulation ourselves so i think again in herbal and ayurveda this is what is needed is we made a reference formulation using all right materials where we did all quality assessment and we knew that when this material says that it should have so much of gallic acid it should have ursolic acid we did all those methods also and we made a reference formulation so that was for us the right formulation and when we compared with pushyanu ga chuna many other formulations from manufacturers were not up to the mark so when this is the scenario to begin with i think research is really needed that's for younger uh, generation students here proper research with a goal where you are working properly can definitely go as startup and where you take such formulations which are being used but there is no data saying that how it works how is the quality as as dr lada has also spoken about it we had done a project of ayush for government of india where we made 26 uh we made sops for 26 formulations ayurvedic formulations 
which found place in Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia yeah. of India. So that's a big thing for us from Ruya College. Both of us were a part of it. We also made SOP of Kumkumadi Tela, Jatyadi Tela, Anu Tela, and each, just to tell you, like, for example, Kumkumadi Tela had 30 plant ingredients, and then there were minerals, and then there was bile of ox, which is for which is responsible for slow ble bleaching. That's why it's used for fairness, Kumkumadi Tela. So they are fantastic formulations, Ayurvedic formulations, which are, the details are given in Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia about the ingredients, Ayurvedic formulary. So startups can start, I think, some work in this direction. Do it with honesty, complete honesty, because there are many scary things like you increase arsolic acid, you add it to some uh, uh, plant of Tulsi and show that that is in high content. That is the reality, actually, what is going on in pharma industry. Unfortunately, I think sir can add to that. Yeah, one thing is there uh, as a startup, it's very easy to sell a nutraceutical. You make tulsi oil, it will sell <laughs> because everybody believes it is tulsi oil, it is smelling and it will sell. And that's what is happening now. Uh, but if you want to grow and sustain your industry or sustain your business, I think you need to have a very clear understanding of your material that you're using and your vendors. Uh, the main problem is vendors. You know, every company needs continuous supply of these plant material, these extracts, and every vendor has its own certification of how this extract is. So we do a lot of work for the industry where we give them certification parameters for certain plant extracts. So you say you use this and tell your vendor to match this then you know you have a sustainability of your product so as startups if you are going in for nutraceuticals or any kind of herb or phytochemical based products stick to the quality of the raw material and ensure that it comes from the vendor in complete quality that you want and if you. that's where i would say that we need experts like dr lada who would help us to bring that particular level of purity of your raw materials and then you know compromising is not going to sustain your business that's a very pertinent point and one one thing uh, i would like to mention there was some student uh, uh, among the participants yesterday from the pharma background who also mentioned uh, whilst we were discussing about natural ingredients in cosmetics the student also mentioned that we are ready to incorporate what but would the supply chain back it up i was very happy to listen that the term from a pharma student that whether they use natural ingredients or not but students now are thinking about the supply chain as well so that that's where uh, good teachers and colleges come into picture where students at their graduate level start understanding i think sir you have a pertinent point can here but again can i add something there yeah, yeah, sure, you sure. just it just stuck me because i just finished that project yeah you know onion oil Nowadays, you see a lot of uh, yeah. ads with hair oils containing onion oil. Onion oil is a very expensive ingredient to be added into the oils. You know, we had a company who had come to us and they wanted some method by which the, uh, you know, the, uh, the sulfur compounds, volatile sulfur compounds could be estimated. We had to use a GC FPD system. Now, this is not available with the industry so often. So if you go into that kind of accuracy, then of course you can sustain the quality of that onion oil. You wouldn't believe they gave some six different vendors who had given them onion oil and only one of them turned out to be really good onion oil. So this is where the supply chain, as you rightly mentioned, uh, it's very important for the product sustainments. Sir, can I earn a category if I guess the brand? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this I'm is the raw material. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. So, so again, uh, one question to you. There is, uh, as industry, we see a pent-up demand or a delta demand, as we uh, call it, for a lot of natural ingredients. I'm sure Mr. Patil also would be, uh, would be getting a lot of such inquiries. Now, because you do a lot of research also, is it really a pent up and a delta demand or is the world moving in that direction now? 
I will agree with that. There, there is a big demand and there is a change in the consumer perception, which the companies are starting to, uh, you know, uh, capitalize. I'll give you an example. Recently, there was a, a demand by a fragrance manufacturer who was uh, who is a big uh, supplier of rose essence. And then they suddenly said that now we need to change it into, um, you know, more uh, natural process. So now we are trying to develop rose essence production using yeast and fermentation. So so he he is already making a big profit. His company is running only on that single flagship product. But he's saying now the demand is changing. So people want natural, even synthetic. They don't want more of synthetic. They want more of naturals. So he's changing from chemical synthesis to fermentation. Uh, same manner, there is a lot of proteins that people have identified which are coming from microbial sources. And these proteins are now going to be very important as uh, therapeutic agents, in especially in antibiotic resistant cases. So these are changes that are happening. Companies are going into more of natural processes involving biologics as one of the alternative to synthetic. I mean, Dr. Ledda will uh, agree with me. This is a sea change that is happening in yeah. the production process yeah. because everybody wants that green label yeah. in their uh, production process also. So, so Mr. Patil, when, uh, to pick it up from here, when we talk about being green, being sustainable, generally, it has, uh, it has an angle of cost. So you are a very well-established industrialist. How easy or difficult is it for you to move or change your production processes to suit sustainable or greening practices? See, I'm manufacturing some few products for the pharma, especially surfactants. Uh, but the pharma industry is very much uh, regulated, means a lot of regulation like IP, BP, USP, and all these things. So getting, uh, first thing it, you need to get it, uh, approvals and all these things, and it's a very difficult to change or immediately. So it will take time, slowly. No, but then, then does cost... Justify. Yeah, yeah, it is a cost because when you just like you said, you are investing into it. So you said it is an investment or it is a cost. But for this financial year, it might be cost. But afterwards, it will be the it will be you know, it will be can wipe up that. No? But but sir uh, and madam both, if if I have to understand the gist of what he is saying, is regulation becoming an impediment then? Uh, see, I don't see regulation become sorry. I'll just uh, give that point and give you. Re see, what is regulator's outlook? Let's look. If you see the Indian pharmacopoeia and the definition of new drugs and whatever, even phytochemicals, their outlook is let the population get best of the products which are properly licensed and properly certified. But at the same time, the cost should not be prohibitive. Otherwise, people won't be able to of take course. it. So they have to balance both the and as, and, uh, as Patil sir very rightly said, manufacturers cannot change so fast. I'll give you a simple example. You're all aware of it. Capsule, gelatin capsule. We want vegetarian gelatin. Has it really come? No, because it's expensive. They are trying to replace, uh, you know, non-vegetarian gelatin to uh, algal gelatin and, uh, you know, sea, uh, seaweed uh, gelatin. But today it is very costly. Yeah. Compared to one capsule that you get, this is about three, four times more expensive. Now, somebody can still sell it with a label saying that I am totally vegetarian. Then it would sell, you know, but then you have to pay a more cost. Yeah. So the market becomes small. But slowly, people are trying to change. So maybe that small percentage may slowly increase. And he rightly said, today it may be an investment. But in future, that may also give me good returns. Thank you so much. So, so sir, now that you are you are being so vocal and open about it, what would you... Now, I am asking the question, same question which ma'am asked to both of us. What would be your message to the upcoming entrepreneurs, especially in this 
field that you're talking about? What would be that one message that you would want to give them? Uh, I sincerely would advise the young entrepreneurs who are getting into nutraceuticals or any phytochemical based business, let it be cosmeceuticals or any kind of thing. Be honest to the quality because that's one major area where there is a big question mark. You will find market people selling because this I hear from many of my clients. Dr. Menon, why are you charging us so much? The other party is making the same kind of profit. Why should I uh, spend so much with you? This has to change somewhere because you will see that whatever you have stuck to your honesty will take you much, much longer in the market. People make profits at a short time but yours would be a lower profit which will sustain you for a long time and that's what you need to look out for because tomorrow's world is for phytochemicals and biologics. So this I always tell that my students also that please get more involved into phytochemicals, natural molecules, bioactives and also biologic proteins. These are going to be very, very important ingredients tomorrow. I mean, just in next, maybe in 10 years, things are going to change. So it, it cannot be a coincidence. We have, we had two panel discussions. There was one in the morning before lunch and this panel discussion happening and almost all the three panel members in the morning spoke that the mantra for success is honesty. And uh, two panel members here, ma'am, also spoke about honesty. Sir also spoke about being honest. So it's very important for students to understand that the message of the day is very clear. You need to be honest and ethical to, to go ahead in life. I think, well, principal, ma'am, you should have one lecture on honesty. <laughs> the, uh, sir, the, can I add to yeah, that? Yeah, please, sure. I was waiting for my turn. Uh, to continue with what sir said and what Dr. Menon said, we have a treasure of biodiversity in India. And whenever, as a botanist, as a person who is working with herbal uh, drugs for last 20 years, I feel there is so much in your own country, which is yours. You are not borrowing anything from anybody. What is lacking is that you work with honesty, ethically, and that is simple. You just use the right materials. I do understand the dilemma of pharma companies that there is no supply. Like say, for, for example, if you talk about saffron being used in Kumkumadi Taila, there is uh, 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 not enough supply of saffron and so many other plants. But if you work with honesty, sincerely, and as Dr. Menon said, towards it, you will definitely sustain for a longer time. I do understand there are sh short goals. You have to be successful. You want to be successful like sir, but you have to work hard, you ask him. But I always feel that, of course, working hard is always there, but work with sincerity and honesty. You will go longer. You will sustain for longer time. This is for younger students. And I'm sincerely saying it. If you have, if you give good quality to people, as a consumer also I'm saying it, we will pay for it. But when I know that the quality which you have given me, somewhere you did cheating. Like say for example, I remember one, sh uh, um, one shampoo I think it was, or uh, uh, hair color, where they had used uh, uh, walnut oil in that. And they had to withdraw it from the market because actually walnut oil was not there in that. In, in the in the shampoo or, or hair color, right? So if you don't work sincerely, because many times, many consignments of herbal products come back to our country when the companies are exporting them because they are not of good quality. Many a times we face these situations, you know? So please see that you work with honesty, sincerity, hard work is definitely there. And then you can, you can go longer. You can definitely go longer then. So that's my message. Thank you so much. So I have last two questions, one for Mr. Patil and one for both of you. Mr. Patil, uh, 
what are the difficulties now the research phase is over and you have to incorporate ingredients into uh, into your pr production system or or the final product what are the difficulties or impediments that you you face and how do you tide over it that is what students would want to know this is again that's a same answer it's a regulatory it takes the time and if you any novel drug if you want to introduce uh, you have to take the regulatory permissions from the suppose in the one country you take the permission but other country has got different set of uh, regulations so every time you have to take and it is a lengthy process so it's not a shortcut like or yesterday we were talking about the cosmetics so there they themselves said that there is no such a hard uh, uh, regulations for the cosmetics right like uh, this thing so that is a more uh, this thing and sir uh, to you because both of you were talking about the opportunities in biologics or uh, such natural molecules uh, and as ma'am rightly said that india is a great country with a great amount of knowledge but if you look at the global map because i come from an industry background i would like to put it like this we don't see ourselves there we might we might be very proud uh, that we are the vaccine suppliers to world but the truth is truth and we are still we have still not um, risen on the map Uh, and you understand right where, what i am saying so how do you look at with this young generation sitting how do you look how is india poised and where do you see india becoming a superpower in that fraternity uh i'm sorry a lot of pharma companies are there i mean uh, it's it's been my dream since i started drug toxicology you know i my first uh, drug toxicology study was ciprofloxacin i mean it's a it's a almost over the counter drug now in but that's the first uh, toxicity study that i did and th since that day i have been dreaming that when will india have its own molecule i mean i don't know in the next 10 years also whether it is going to come i mean this is where we are i mean you just mentioned about vaccine absolutely hats off to those con i mean the company uh who came out with uh, covaxin okay on a platform which was absolutely proven but still they came out with it after that if you see the government had openly given uh, you know invitation to any pharma companies please start making the vaccine how many of them came you know kiran mujumdar she said very clearly i'm i'm really looking at who is going to take up this challenge nobody came that's because our r&d investment of our pharma is targeted to generics let us be very clear because we don't have the kind of budget in our pharma which is like two times the budget of maharashtra state to get a drug into the market so that means you are planning for the next 12 to 13 years even today with all those parallel mechanism of manufacturing still you have to spend lot of time we saw that happening with a vaccine yeah. still they had to do lot of time in regulatory and as he rightly said regulatory is definitely going to be an impediment you know uh, i don't mind telling the name of the company here because it's an age old story we did a trial on odomos because dabar wanted to sell it in europe and the european regulatory agency said we are not going to take your odomos even if it is 70 and year old and people have been using left right and center in when i was an infant my mother has applied it on me but they didn't take it Balsara. yeah balsara had was taken over by dabar and then we had to do a trial km had to do a trial on infants to prove that it doesn't have toxicity i mean we never thought of it no everybody in this audience including the seniors here sitting have used this in their infancy so that, so as the same thing is with our traditional knowledge she said biodiversity is huge we have you know there is there is a plant which it has come lot of time in the newspaper in ayush has been working on it uh, icmr has started work on it this plant if you eat stops your appetite i mean you don't feel hungry tribals are using it and they know what that plant is whatever it is it is a vagus nerve you know inhibitor 
so you don't feel hungry it's a huge potential it's never come as a drug it's been known since almost 10 20 years it's not come as a drug i mean there is a dearth of putting money in rnd i mean until that happens i don't think we will cross i mean it's a very pessimistic statement but i'm feeling bad about it yeah. to say that uh, same is the scenario in herbals also sir there are as we spoke about biodiversity in india but then every company wants to use the molecule i would call it also uh, which is already there like ginseng they want texol they want they want everything what is so popular already eugenol or something no one wants to really try out anything which is new because then there will be lot of studies which will have to be done on it uh one last thing to you sir from your side a message to the young aspiring entrepreneurs can we hack the mic to sir please uh well i am in any my mess now <laughs> so a so, good a good message to the aspiring entrepreneur yes and but when it comes to the phytochemistry and since uh, i've been talking about the phytochemicals i will just request you to have a look at the you know prices of some of these phytochemicals and i don't think i need to tell you thereafter what need to be done you make one or two grams and i can i can tell you you need not work for a year <laughs> <laughs> okay that is the price of the phytochemicals and more and more phytochemicals will be required in the future that me i can tell you in fact i have discussed this matter way back in 1998 with then the lakhina was commissioner of the fda and uh, i asked him actually to enforce on the ayurvedic fraternity that they must comply to the requirement of uh, i mean uh, finding out the phytochemicals which are present in the raw material first only raw material formulation is much complicated but then it did not happen actually later on all the pharmacopeia came and they are all none of them is mandatory it is all only guideline today none of the pharmacopeia is mandatory i'm still waiting for it when the fda makes it mandatory i'll make more business <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much thank you so much sir thank you panelists for the wonderful thank discussion thank you so much. i request you to be thank on you. the stage i request you to be on the stage abhishek thank mr ajit patel sir thank you so much for your time today sir ladies and gentlemen a big round of applause for mr ajit patel thank you so much sir next up i'd like to request dr sunita shailaja ma'am thank you so much for your time today Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. And finally, Dr. Sachin Kumar Gandhi, sir, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll also take a group picture, sir. Everyone, send the speech. Ladies and gentlemen, one last time, a big round of applause for this incredible family. Current scenario of natural ingredients in pharma. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, ladies. All right. Uh, do we have all the IC presentations ready? Yes, yes. All right, definitely. 
All right. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, just a bunch of quick announcements. All right. We are going to be creating history at exactly 5.30 p.m. right here in this auditorium. So I want everyone to be here, be present at 5.30. I can't reveal what it is yet, but trust me on this. If you know me, know what I've done for the past 36 hours, you'll want to be here. We are going to be creating history in this particular place. All right. On that note, if a gentle reminder for all the I3 presentations, if some team hasn't submitted it yet, please submit it at the laptop station in front of the stage. And also now we can proceed towards T. All right. All the students to my left and all my dignitaries to my right. Yeah. We will be back exactly at 4.10 p.m., ladies and gentlemen, so that we can start at 4.15 p.m. All right. Five minutes buffer, 4.10 p.m. I'll see you back here. Thank you. 